The or the? The or the? All you need to know is the Hannibal TV. The interview of my life, Hustle Rip Rogers is coming to the number one network. That's right, the Hannibal TV. We're gonna be talking stories about WWE. We're gonna be talking about training. We're gonna be talking about 40 years in the wrestling business. We're gonna be talking about old school wrestling. We're gonna be talking about wrestling in England, Austria, Germany, South Africa, Japan, Korea, United States, Canada. And where are we gonna hear that at? Come on, set the dial, come on back. Get your sandwiches, go to the bathroom, can get back. Come on back, get ready to watch. Where? At the, the Hannibal TV. Thank you very much, love. This is Hannibal from the HannibalTV.com, and today we have Rip Rogers in the studio, who's a former WCW competitor, and he's wrestled all over the world and trained some of the top superstars of today. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm living the dream here at the gym at 6 a.m. Coming back, having some having some coffee here, get to talk to you. Life don't get better than that. Living the dream. And this shoot interview for those listening is going to be all over the place because we just happened to do this. I haven't done much research, but I think I know about enough about Rip to uh, to get through this. And he's a great talker. So, uh, how did you get interested in wrestling to begin with? Well, my whole life, all I want to do is be a wrestler. Okay. So I go to Seymour High School, which is famous for basketball, which is the largest high school gym in the world in the world so wow. you you don't really want to be on a wrestling team and have 60 people there when you can have up to 8,000 people there for a high school basketball game so anyway but all I want when I graduated from Seymour High School in 1972 I said I'm gonna go to college play football then I want to be a championship wrestler but I didn't know how the hell to get there because everything was tight-lipped you didn't they didn't you didn't know anything about it so I was going to college and uh, I wrote Bern Gagne a letter. He had a, he had a camp. He wrote me back. And he said, uh, uh, we just graduated a class. Uh, there was a bunch of football players. I think Buddy Rose was in it. Rick Steamboat was in it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. He said, I can get you in the next one. So I said, okay. But in the meantime, I went off and got my Carl and Hildegard trunks, my shimmer cape, my bolero, my cheap boxing boots. And this showed up at one place. A guy let me. So... I got in and the guy said, hey, you look pretty good. You got good gear and uh, you can have a match. I said, great. He said, oh, you look pretty good. He says, uh, uh, you work baby face or heel? And I said, yeah, you know, <laughs> didn't know what the hell he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, okay, you go over, uh, you can go over the first match because you're built good. Go over the match and, I'm, and he said, now you get the pencil, go home. When I get the pencil, go home. Okay, let's just say my uh, first match was is a two-hour story, which we don't have time for. But I survived, yeah. and and eventually, so uh, guys trying to go to a wrestling school, or whatever, don't worry about it. I was the worst wrestler in the history of pro wrestling, with everything. So if I say you're the shits, I was ten times worse. So take it with a grain of salt. So you never had any formal training. No, you just no formal learned training. as you went along. I I learned in the ring. Who was one of the people that uh, helped you out the most? Basically, I was trained by the Popo family. I used to live with Randy Savage, uh, Lanny, his father, hell, his mother would do my hair, uh, uh, Angelo uh, was there, and everything I learned in the wrestling business, probably the first 95% was the first four years in the business I got by staying with him. It's like I worked for the Maritimes for uh, Emile Dupre because Paul Christie, I was working for Dick the Bruiser and the old Sheik and he would book me out to do TVs and stuff. And then I hooked up with Randy. They brought me into Maritimes for Dupre first time. And I, was, I was Hercules Samard. French. I was French Canadian, but I didn't know any words except wee oui, wee, oui, and that was it, you know. So, so I did that. And then Randy booked me down in Nashville for Nick Goulas. Then his father booked me in the Mississippi for Frankie Kane, who was the great Mephisto. And uh, uh, Frankie gave me the name Rip Rogers. Uh, before then, I was my real name, Mark Shirer. Then I was uh, Hercules Samar. Then I was my great idea, the disco kid. Was, uh, it got over like a lead balloon. And then I became Rip Rogers because that was Eddie Graham's uh, wrestling name in Texas in 1955. And uh, 
uh, Mephisto, Frankie Kane, he said, you remind me of Eddie Graham. I said, holy shit, that's good, right? So uh, I became, and I've been Rip Rogers since uh, uh, basically January 1st, 1979. So how did you run into the Paphos for the first time? Just the the first time, this old carny named Don Pruitt got me booked for Nick Goulas down at like the Christmas Spectacular. Mm -hmm. So I was Lanny Paphos' tag team partner, and so Lanny knew who I was. And then Paul Christie was a personal friend of the Paphos for years, and they had worked together a lot. So he told me they was going to go to the Maritimes and whatever, blah blah blah. So he gave me Randy's number. So I called Randy up, and uh, we hit it off, and blah blah blah. And then over the next four years, he was like my, my best friend, my mentor. I learned editing, booking, dubbing, and all that stuff just by not by being just by hanging around and being there with my mouth shut and my ears o open and not having an opinion. In the meantime, I got to make trips with uh, Bob Roop, Bob Orton Jr., uh, Professor Malenko to learn from these guys. It was just unbelievable because here I was in my early 20s and I and then and then Randy and him that they I was one of the owners of ICW and uh, basically because uh, they needed somebody that was dependable and uh, was I any good no I would get Randy's hand me down robes hand me down this hand me down that he would teach me uh, 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 the tricks and he'd show me how, on his book how we'd be doing TVs and this one was four weeks ahead of of the other and this guy's turned heel but he's not going to turn heel in this market until the tape plays whatever blah 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 and that little old outlaw talk, uh, territory we had at ICW uh, we actually on some some weekends we actually ran three towns a night wow how did that work with such a small crew what we would do we had like a uh, 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 an Eastern Inn with Ronnie Garden would have like the TVs that overlapped with Oak Hill, West Virginia TV, uh, Hazard TV, the Lexington TV, Louisville TV, Memphis, Evansville, and four of them in, uh, 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 oh, or in Illinois. And then we actually got paid for some TVs in uh, two of them in Wyoming, one in Mobile, and one in Puerto Rico. They would pay us for the tapes. Okay. And we learned about promotion now, Miser, which is Angelo. I gave him the name Miser. He was the carpetbagger, but then I called him the Miser. So then he became the Miser. Okay. But, but he, he would bankroll pretty much everything. So when we had to get a new Iveco ring truck, he spent $33,000 for that. When we had to get, he had, we had a couple diesel, uh, diesel vans, and they were like sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars a piece that he bought them, and this is like 19, about 1981 or early 82. So the the boys had reliable transportation, and uh, and we had a lot of t. Hell, we were going against Barnett. We was going against the Bruiser. We was going against uh, some of the places, the old Sheik, against Bob Geigel, against Vern Gagne, against uh, Jerry. J we was outlaws to everybody. Didn't care if Ron. We just ran shows, and we worked hard. And but we had the B T V, they would have the good strong station, we would have the weaker station. And since the other guys have been there long, they were the incumbents, they looked upon as major leaguers and we were the uh the young upstarts or, or whatever. And now some places like in Eastern Kentucky and Tennessee, Ronnie Garvin and Roop and Orton, these guys were over, you know, and uh they were top pros. But they all found out like I did that promoting is a whole lot harder than you think it is and you might draw this much money and the boy said oh these are good houses but the bills this month were that much so you're dipping and the boys are actually making more money than us yeah. but we were outlaws and we was working and loving wrestling and doing what we like to do so what the hell and they talked about blackballing if you could work you could draw you they would use you because the promoters were all, they was all a bunch of thieves. <laughs> it was all a bunch of carnies yeah. too anyway. Now I got Bill Dundee's version of the, the story when okay. him and Lan, uh, Randy had their altercation. I was there. Okay. Oh, you were there? I that. was there. That's like, do you ever hear about the Randy the Waffle House thing? The oh, Dutch yeah. Mantel would talk about He her. told us that version. Okay, too. but okay. he wasn't there. It was just me and Randy. Okay. The Bill Dundee thing. Nobody was, I was there, Pez was there, Thunderbolt Patters was there, uh, all the people that was there, and they, there was, uh, I think Candy Devine got some something about it. Candy wasn't there, she didn't tip nobody off. It was somebody else, but I'm not gonna say. And the, the way the story is, it's much more exciting what everybody else says. 
Okay. Yes. Do I know what the, the truth was? Yes. Now, if you would ask me, did Bill get punched in the jaw? Yes. Was it because uh, he wore Macho Man trunks? Yes. Randy, I love him like a brother. He was my mentor. Jesus Christ, I idolized this guy. I never seen anybody so intent, intense, paranoid, you know what I mean? But he lit a fire under my ass by making me, because I was so laid back, doop, 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 uh, just a good athlete, but didn't never been in a real fight in my life or nothing, you know what I mean? And Randy, was, let's say he would get in scuffles and he'd get mad at me because I wouldn't jump in and get, I'm not, I'm not, Randy, you got to, I'm not getting arrested. Hell, I got a speeding ticket and that's it. I'm keeping it that way. He couldn't understand that. But I uh, love the guy to death. Very, very intense. Learned so much from him. Idolized him. You know what I mean? So uh, that's that. But did Bill get sucker punched? Yes. Uh, did he take a gun, get a gun, get taken away from him? And ran? No. He got punched, and then Randy was talking shit to him. Bill said, oh, let me get something from my jaw or whatever, right, in the, in the trunk. And he pulled the gun out. Then all of a sudden, everybody's running. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's basically what happened. And what about the Waffle House incident since, since you brought it okay, up? Okay, so I'm just sitting there. Uh, we just worked Nashville that night. Me and Randy went out to get some uh, steak and eggs or whatever, right? This guy comes in. The thing probably took... 90 seconds, you know what I mean? And But they have a two hour story with it, right? So a guy comes in, he says, hey everybody, I'm getting married, you ought to congratulate me, right? Randy had been, after the match was over, on whatever, <laughs> you know, so he's, so Randy had to say, who gives a fuck, holy shit. It's where the guys worked, it's, I guess maybe the, the wife was a waitress, I have no idea. But to make a long story short, it sort of ruined our meal, <laughs> and then Randy, uh, he said, give me a knife, so I threw him, not a butter knife, <laughs> but then basically not much happened. The cops come in, they realized who it was, and, they, and Randy would not back down no matter what, so he was sort of like taking the sticks away from the cops, and they was hitting him, and he had knots and blood and everything all over, but then Bold the Dog come in, and, and uh, he, Randy did the job for Bo. So he had to, got bit in the butt and bit in the hamstring and shit, you know, and then I had to go get his dad and, and we went down there. He was at the thing, handcuffed to a pole or whatever. And uh, George Weingroff's dad saw he worked at the jail or whatever, right? So he was pulling some strings to get him out, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, but I always liked how somebody who wasn't there could tell a story. So I was there, nobody else but me. Uh, uh, Were you afraid at any point during that when, it, uh, when he asked you for the knife, even though you're saying it was just a butter knife? Do you know what's so... No, he said it. God damn it, this is a butter knife. Okay. <laughs> but the thing about it is, when you get caught up in the wrestling business, you're looking at stuff that's real as a work, as a rib. When I was having a box, in boxing match, I'm throwing working punches because it's all a rib to me. And the guy's trying to kill me. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just hard to fucking to go back and forth uh, of the reality and what's bullshit and whatever. And I was always in a playful mood, so I'm like sort of chuckling. I said, oh, fuck, Randy. She shut a promo on this guy. Give me the butter knife. Oh, fuck. Oh. You know what I mean? But uh, What was it like living with him? Well, let's just say there was a lot of holes in the wall. And he taught me how to answer the phone. Or, this is before they had caller ID and stuff. So when anybody would call, he'd go, hello. Right away, whoever's talking, he's got them back, backpedaling right away. <laughs> so, oh, that's pretty cool. But he talked about it. Everything was psychological of how to do this, how to that, and how he'd just stare a hole right through you and everything. And, but God, we was a Nick, and we, we'd, have a, we'd go out, and we'd have no money in our pockets on purpose, but I didn't have any. <laughs> And we would go to the steakhouse and eat the scraps off and spend no money. It was just awesome. Yeah, he was really cheap, wasn't he? Well, you got to remember, Angelo was born in uh, 1925, so grew up in the Great Depression. They had no running water. They had no electricity. He was an only child, and basically they spoke uh, Italian, right? So here he was in this world, so he was determined he was going to provide. He was determined 
that his family was not going to have financial stress. So and he was determined no matter what he made, he was going to put that money back for them for later. So he's just a hell of a father, a hell of a husband and doing shit the way most people should be doing stuff. You know what I mean? So and all the time I was so her terrible, he never raised his voice to me. Which I'm a yeller and a screamer. But people see once they train under me, they know that it's all a rib. Guys are scared to death that the company say, You're funnier than shit. I said, Oh well, yeah, it takes a while to figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if, like when you're coaching, some people you can coach, you can talk soft to them, but they don't get it. You yell and scream and cuss at them, they remember that fucking thing the rest of your life. Can I cuss on here or not? Sure. Okay. I, I, I think I, that was my first one that slipped out, but I'm trying to be a good boy. <laughs> so. <laughs> Were you around when he first met Elizabeth? When I, okay, when I, when I was there, Elizabeth worked at Sente Sports Center, this huge uh, complex for training. They had an actual wave pool and everything. And she worked at the front desk taking keys. Like when you come in, she'd take the key and hang it up. And uh, she was a little bit heavy. And uh, Randy and the women didn't get, Randy was, he was like a little boy around women. <laughs> when he would go into character, which the only time I saw him break character in his life was when his little dog died. And he just talked about his dog. He said, well, I guess I'll get me another one. You know what I mean? But he had the room and he had the home plate. He had pictures of the dog up and he got his new dog and named it Backup Dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he was, uh, sometimes he would, he would sort of like be a bully but whatever reasons it was, they were his. He had demons, who don't? But he would give you, I think he would give you the shirt off his back, you know what I mean? And uh, if you needed, if he did anything, I think he'd give it to you, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of my language I learned from him and Ole Anderson doing the finishes. Every other word was the bad word, you know? And I just thought it was normal. And. Uh, so I looked at him as like my big brother. So anything he did, I emulated. You know what I mean? And I was like little junior, Randy Savage Jr., whatever, not as good, by no means. That's like years ago, I was gonna be the first guy in WWE, WWF with the valet gimmick. And then, uh, but he got the gig, it was a total different thing. Like Elizabeth was a, uh, the first female that was really pushed. You know what I mean? And then they made, uh, shit loads of money, tons of money, and whatever. But uh, he, what, what was your gimmick going to be? Well, just me and uh, uh, the first, I was going to be the one with the first valet, the traditional valet, traditional whatever. But then who the booker was, I won't turn, but he was concerned about my size. And I'm not going to take no gas. No. All the guys that basically took it, most of them are dead. I didn't want to take that shit, you know. Uh-uh. But not saying was that's their choice. And at the time, I don't think it was against the law. I was scared what would happen. And most of my old buddies that did, they would die of heart attacks and stuff uh, from that uh, and whatever. But I just chose not to do it. So then you never got a shot there for that reason? Well, I, I don't know that. I, I never really had a, no desire to go there. This is how stupid I was. It was never about the money. It was about learning, going to different places, going to different territories, meeting different fucking people, meeting different contacts, seeing different things of television for later on down the line, to learn the business from the bottom floor up. Learning all this great shit, and, and then like when I went to Europe and I told, uh, it's like when uh, Lord Regal got his job here because I told him what to say to Bill Watts and he got a job, right? Yeah. And then when he got a job, then he Taylor- He says that in his book, by the way, for oh. anyone watching this. Okay, uh, so Taylor yeah. and Finley got in, right? Yeah. It's all who you know. And then, so I got Max Payne a job because Max was a shooter from Iowa State, you know, as Daryl Peterson. Uh, and uh, so I'd have him write Bill Watts a letter. So he got a job. So you got, so I, I was always on the lookout and uh, for talent for Ole. And then Ole actually let me run towns for him. 
And then uh, as WCW or Georgia Championship? No, it was WCW. Okay. When he was the boss there, so I run developmental town. I lived in Indiana, so he give give me like five days. I'd run five high schools or whatever, and I was the and uh, I was the boss. I ran the shows. I'd work the first match, and then I'd come back and announce because you got a announcer got paid. Uh, if I I'd get the jacket, so I got paid. I would keep the time and the bell, so I got paid. I was the the agent, so I get paid. I'd work the first match. I get paid. I get the mileage. I get the, uh, the 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 stipend. Any hotel if I wanted. Blah blah blah. So it was great. So, but I loved Bill Watts. I loved Ole. There's not any, I don't think there's anybody I really didn't like working for. Uh, I just wanted to uh, put me in coach. This is my, you know, it's like the concussion thing, please. You know when you get in professional wrestling, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get, con that's just the way it is, you know that. Don't say you worked 20 years and all of a sudden you worked at WWE and it was your fault you had a concussion, please. Right. Don't treat me like a mark. Billy Jack Haynes is what was one of the leaders of that lawsuit. I, I don't get along too well with him, but what are your thoughts on him? Billy, uh, Billy was a tremendous athlete. Billy looked great. Billy, I would not say boo to because I was scared to death of him. Because I could just see he had that fire in his eyes and he was just looking for, he was just looking for a reason to beat you up. I was, I was scared to death of him. You know what I mean? So, but I had some matches with him, press slam, but oh hell yeah. You know, great talent, great talent. And Don Owens had the philosophy, he would never break in the local boys, they'll come back to haunt you, which is exactly what happened there. Then he got the commission on Don when he ran his own territory there, you know, and he had some great stuff. But then after that, then it made it, you had to draw more money to break even because uh, the commission was more strict and you couldn't do as many things and stuff. And but that's but no, I was scared. He was a tremendous athlete. He was a great draw, and I was scared to death of him. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned boxing. I've seen the pictures of you with the boxing gloves on, but I didn't realize that was a shoot that you were doing. How did you end up getting well, into boxing? Scott Romer here. You know Romer. Yes. He's here right, and he, we're rooming together tonight. Okay. And this and I just left him out of bed. Uh, <laughs> but this and that. But uh, uh. Fred Burns was the boxing promoter in Indianapolis for years. So I'm 41 years old. Romer says, hey, you want to uh, uh, have a fight? Sure. So there's this guy named, the first fight was a guy named Monty Cox. And he had a lot to do with MMA, like in Iowa and stuff. And he was a sports writer and stuff. So I was going to box him in his hometown. Had I been in the boxing ring in my life? No. Did I have any boxing skills? No. But did I, was I in shape? Yes. Did I get nervous? No, I was treating it like a boxing match. I didn't know if it was real, if it was not real or whatever. I asked the promoter, I said, what do you want? You know what I mean? <laughs> he said, oh, do what you want to do. So I said, Monty, say, hey, I'm fighting. And as soon as he saw me at the time, I was, I was 41, and he had, had been an amateur boxer, not me. You know, hell, I couldn't fight. But a lot of stuff, I'd, as the guys, uh, this guy come down who had fought, uh, I think his name was Terry Lusk or what? But anyway, he come down and he says, "I can make." He says, "How old are you?" I said, "Really? I'm 41." He says, "Man," he says, "I said I can't fight." He goes, "No, but you look like you can fight. I can show you the rest." I said, "Man, if I was 25, I, I would do it, but I don't want to really get hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? It hurts, you know." And I and I had a couple more fights that were real, and I got really knocked out, and it was just like the Rocky movie where you didn't. You didn't, you heard the blows, you didn't really feel them, and everything was spinning around, and everything was wibble wobble, and I, I was drunk, and I was laughing. But I told Monty, I said, hey, uh, uh, I said, if you give me your payday, uh, I'll put you over, first round, you know what I mean? So I don't give a shit. And then uh, he didn't want to. He, he wanted to earn it, or what? I said, well, okay. So I, we went out the first 30 seconds, and this motherfucker's trying to, he's throwing bombs. He's trying to kill me. Then all of a sudden I saw the, huh, I said, oh, he's mine now. So I'm hitting him with half-assed real punches, some working punches, knocked him down three times in the second round and they stopped it. But he was so nervous, he was in his hometown. He promoted the show, he did the newspaper, he did the radio, the TV, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he would he could have collapsed in the third round by himself if nobody was in there with him. 
He was just so nervous. Because to me, hell, I had my Malcolm X hat on, my pink cut a promo on the fans and everything, blah, blah, blah. And I was just treated as a wrestling show. But then I had some other, uh, there used to be a Were you fight. paid for those? Huh? You were paid for those, I hope. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't go to the ring unless I got my money first, you know. It was in my boot, just like wrestling, you know. So um, uh, they used to have a, a tough man contest, Our Door Limited or something like that years ago. So I'm in the Louisville tough man contest, but I'm there in a boxing match against this guy named Cody Koch, the Alaskan assassin. He actually fought one of the Klitschko boys and he was ahead on points and got knocked out in the 12th round, but he was gonna fight me. So I'm in Louisville Gardens and he says, I said, hey, I'm, I'm working with you. What? I said, well, I'm fighting you. Yeah. I said, well, I said, well, you're going over the first round, about 90 seconds. He said, what? I said, no, we're, you're going to fight me, but don't you dare touch me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, I, I taught him a little routine, and we did it. He said, man, this is the most fun I ever had in my life. Maybe I can fight you ever. I said, well, I got this new th internet thing now or something. I don't, we couldn't do that now. But the next time I saw him, he bleached his hair blonde. But if you look him up on the internet, Cody Koch, the Alaskan assassin, he was, he was, uh, he got, they killed him. They, uh, uh, he was, they, everybody was scared of him and they choked him out because he was drunk and everything and he actually died. But I, but if, if he would have beat Klitschko, I would have fought a world champion, right? What a yeah. hell of a rib. So then Romer, who's here, now Monty had to have some revenge, right? So were we in the Quad City, I think it was Quad Cities or Moline, or Moline, but I fought Monty in Davenport, Iowa. So I choreographed a fight with Monty and Romer. So, and it was so funny, the, the, they didn't, the guys from the commission come down and they had to weigh Romer in. I think he weighed like 179, but he had to be like 199. So he had the weight belt on underneath the stuff, right? So the guy said, strip down. I said, uh, he's got the weight belt on. He's gotta, have, he's gotta make this weight or he can't fight. Oh, so they just looked at the scale. Oh, and so there he was with the weight belt on. Oh, 199. So, so uh, the boxing business and then the legendary Eddie Sharkey. I think Eddie Sharkey's here at the thing too. So I met oh, Eddie Sharkey. And he had the whole van of guys he had guys to, to put guys over and stuff. I don't know if they got him off the street or whatever. But he was a legend. He trained, uh, you know, the Road Warriors, Rick, all the guys from the bar and yeah. stuff like that. And he was just a, oh man, the stories he could tell. That he was, and he was a, he is a legend, man, Eddie Sharkey, man. Gee whiz. But whatever the original question was, we're completely off base, and I just start talking about BS and stuff, and whatever the original question was. <laughs> and yeah, you answered it. But you brought up uh, Bill Watts in WCW. Did you ever work for him in Mid South? Yes, I worked for him in Mid South. I was brought in to be underneath. He wanted my hair dark. Dark. He said, "You get over, I will fire you." Thank you very much. I know my role. He paid me above average, just to work with the underneath buys to put guys over. I had a good attitude, but just think, I didn't have to gaff. I was no stress of having to draw. All I was was making the towns, having a good time. Worked a lot of shows, meeting a lot of people, and uh, he would bonus me all the time if I had. And it's like when he had WCW, if I worked with his kid, he always double paid me. If there was a pay per view, hey, you wanna you wanna work security, you wanna work a dark match, or what do you wanna do? I said, let me go to the office where you're at, and I'll sit by you, and I'll eat your food, and we can tell stories. Okay. But I never had a problem with him. I loved him. I loved Ole Anderson. Ole, all Ole Anderson did was tell you the truth. And everybody couldn't handle it. Oh, today, butt hurt world. <laughs> yeah, oh, God, he wouldn't be allowed to say anything. He was the smartest guy. He'd be watching something, and all of a sudden he'd say, tell the guy, hey, get that shot from this angle, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Then he's back to tell the story, and then all of a sudden he's supposed to give the guy the cue, and he said, tell him to go home right now, and he's go back to tell the story, and whatever, the guy come back, he says, hey, you should have done this, this, and this. I give you the leeway, I told you what the finish was, now it's your learn to learn this job, so get on it, come on now. And he, he would never lie to you about money or anything like that. One time we were, we were him were on tour some way and Crockett come in and they wanted us to meet this other town and he sent us the tickets. And this is when you could still like cash them in or whatever, right? I remember the tickets were $304 a piece where we had like an eight hour ride. 
And I looked at him and I said, we're driving. He says, you're damn right we're driving. She said, I'll take care of the ticket. So I gave him the ticket and then he ca somehow he cashed the money, gave me the, gave me the ticket money, right? And so he just worked for Crockett and come back to the loop again. But I love working for Ole Anders and I love working for Bill. There wasn't really no I didn't not like. I was uh, easy to get along with anybody. I just loved the wrestling business. Nikita Koloff cashed in his WCW tickets too a lot of the times he okay. told me because he said sometimes with the connections it would be longer than the drive. Right, uh-huh. <laughs> and there's nothing better than being in your car. You don't have to hang around the boys when they're drunks trying to get in fights or that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, uh, this and that, but no, he, he, he had a hell of a successful career. Yeah, he was one of those, all the guys that bounced there and stuff like that. Were you ever backstage for any of the infamous uh, Mid-South fights that happened? Uh, I can't think of any when I was there. It's like the Dick Slater thing, you mean? Yeah, there was, a, there was the Butch Reed one with John Nord. There was Slater I, and Sting. And I wasn't there. Duggan and, and Bourne, I yeah, think. Yeah, this was later. But I was, I was in uh, uh, Jimbo. Duggan was there when I was there. And uh, uh, Matt was, I was in Portland when Matt, when Matt was just starting. And I worked a lot with his dad, Tough Tony. And uh, Matt was a tough guy. Tough Tony, tough guy. Uh, he called punk, called me, called everybody punk. So what the hell, right? But uh, Bill Watts was—he was firm, but he was fair. And uh, this is this is—it's like a couple times, me and Bundy. Uh, I was driving my beat up Pinto, and they would have Bundy in the car. My timing chain went out. We went up, went up through Bastrop Elite. We was either going to Greenville, Greenwood, Mississippi, whatever. So. We broke down. I went to the bar. I got the mechanic. He had his kids take us to the show. We got them in, blah, blah, blah. They picked us back. I come back. They drove us to the show, went to the show, watched the show, come back. This guy fixed our car and charged me $90. Wow. How nice. You know what I mean? But we was late for the show, the one hour thing. So, of course, uh, Watts fined us $300, but then he bonused us $300. He, we knew how much we was going to make the slot, you know. And I said, Buns. He said, God damn, Watts, find, find us. And we made the show. I said, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what should you have made? Total it up. He says, well, hell, he overpaid me. The way he knew what the pay scale was, about 300 bucks. I said, and that was the fine. So in other words, he fined you. The boys all knew we got fined. Now I'm getting the goosebumps. And we made the town. So he was still the evil dictator, but he had compassion and we really didn't get fined. That's the little things, you know what I mean? That's like when uh, uh, when I would work with Eric, I said, Bill, okay, I'll work with Eric, you want him to sell, register, what do you want? Whatever you want, just tell me, I'll do it, I'll do it, and he'd double pay me. No question, you know what I mean? Yeah. He was the boss, right? And people would get on there, I said, wait a minute, if I was the promoter, and I had my son, I'm gonna highlight him as much as I can, this might be the only thing in his life to do it. What father wouldn't do that for their kid? You know what I mean? Hell, George Goulas, but Nick Goulas, yeah. right? So, and whatever the question was, now hey, we're Eric, very, uh, now we're very completely <laughs> off again. I'm just yeah. nothing but stories, you know. <laughs> I was wondering, were you in WCW, speaking of Eric, for apparently there was some confrontation with him and Rick Rude. Did that happen? Uh, it obviously did happen. But at the time, I lived in Indiana and uh, worked at a gym, and I would just come in for TV and if I wanted to work shows near to where I live, I had I could just do that. Okay. So did it happen? I remember George Weingroff, who was a real good amateur wrestler, and he was Pez's tag team partner. Uh, they both went to University of Tennessee Chattanooga together. Pez was the heavyweight, and George was like I think it was 185 then, before it was 189 or something. We're going back to college in the early 70s, and uh, George was legally blind. And he was a wrestling coach at the blind school in Indianapolis too, but he was the son of Saul Weingroff, who was in a wrestling business as a manager, whatever, for how many years. Uh, but when Eric was going to high school, Watts employed George as a wrestling coach to teach him wrestling. Okay. To, and Eric was about six, three and a half. Yeah. He was a big boy. And he was a real, hell, he was quarterback at the University of Louisville. So he was smart, he was articulate, he was tough, and he didn't have no fear in his eyes. You know what I mean? And Rude, and Rude was, he was, man, he was tough. He was half nuts. 
<laughs> scared to death. I was half scared to death of everybody. Jesus Christ. These guys were real fucking tough, real fighters, and had that Randy Savage gleam in their eye of wanting to fight for no reason. <laughs> yeah. It's like whenever Randy would go to rest, uh, we go to the restaurant. He'd sit in the back, the back to the wall where he could see everybody. He always thought everybody was going to get him and stuff. And me, by hell, I, didn't, I wasn't street smart. I was from small town Indiana. I was just a hillbilly. I didn't know shit. You know, and these guys knew all this stuff. Oh, well, I, oh yeah, I never thought of that. <laughs> hell, we was going to sleep in the summertime with the windows open and the doors open. Yeah. You know? Wow. So what did you hear happen with that? I know that's just hearsay since you weren't there. But. No, I just heard that, you know, Rick, something about turning him over or whatever and and I and like any story it was probably this and each time they tell it gets a little more and a little more and a little more but that's like you love wrestling stories because uh, uh, it's like it's like your mom and dad when they uh, they trug through uh, th they walk three miles of school e every day with 24 inches of snow you know what I mean yeah uh, so yeah right okay <laughs> and I lived on 10 cents a week you know <laughs> yeah so how did you end up in WCW? Was that uh, Bill Watts bringing you in? Or? Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I worked for Ole. Remember when, uh, uh, I don't know if you was born yet, in 80, 84 when, uh, no, you wouldn't have been born yet. <laughs> oh, I was born in 82, so okay. I'm, uh, but uh, I was probably too young to know what Okay, happened. but they had... Vince took over the yeah, TV I, with I the selling of the, that, yeah. uh, this and that, so Ole got his own time slot. So I was working for Ron Fuller, and the Road Warriors had just left for uh, AWA. That's where they were from, right? Nothing like yeah. being a star where you were from. You know what I mean? They had all that exposure from WCW, right? Uh, when it was on at 6.05 at night on Saturday nights and the Sunday show and stuff. So uh, uh, Bob Armstrong, uh, loved Armstrong's to death, Jesus Christ. They were just so nice. And uh, I was working for Ron Fuller, and I was working a long program with Austin Idol. And he's, and then Bob said, hey, uh, uh, when you leave here, I said, oh, I, I, I sent a tape to this, to Dusty, blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, well, uh, uh, I told Ole Anderson uh, he, wanted, he was looking for somebody to be a transition champion in a tag at, as a heels after the Road Warriors because what they did is you can't follow it so we got to go the other we want the uh, tra traditional bumping chicken shit heel whatever blah blah so okay I can do that so uh, Ole called me on the phone and uh, I just said okay didn't talk money he says can you start it yeah and I said well and I started talking he says look Bob Armstrong uh, told me you could do the job that's all I need to know and that's the way I operated my whole life. You know what I mean? So, and, uh, but anyway, that's how I went to Atlanta the first time. Okay. And then when Crockett bought in, uh, I was working, I'd worked some nice angles with Tommy Rich and was working in the, the last match with Tommy all around the loop. And then when Crockett bought in, uh, I was out. So I went with Wahoo and just went down to Tampa and worked. Okay. So I didn't. There were so many places to work. I didn't give a shit. So I never called up WWE and asked for a job or anything. I didn't care. I just wanted to learn, get better. Hell, you got to remember, you could work Tampa, you could work Pensacola, you could work Watts for Fritz, you could work for Joe Blanchard. Hell, Amarillo, the Brillo, Texas, you could work for Shards, you could work for uh, uh, L.A., you could work for Don Owens, you could work for Gene Kaniski, you could work for Stu, you could work for the, the Montreal thing, you could work for uh, Larry Kosobowski in the Upper Ontario, or you could work the, uh, uh, the J Japan, Korea, uh, the, the England, Austria, Germany stuff, or whatever. And which I eventually got to all that and stuff like that by meeting people. You get the loops, you get the contacts, blah, blah, blah. You learn the different styles. You, work, you learn the, the old world of sport thing with the English thing, which is the greatest thing. Holy shit, it was, you know, and you meet people, you have fun. And I just love wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> and how we got into that, I have no idea. <laughs> Who were uh, some of the tougher guys to work with in WCW? We've heard some stories about uh, some, some people like to rough up the lower talent. I just know that a lot of times, well, here's a good story. You'd like this because uh, work son was Stan Hansen and Stan was like a goddamn, he, could, he couldn't see very good. Hell, he's almost, he couldn't see shit. 
But I was working a, a cage match with Ole, and we was beating him up in the cage. Stan was supposed to make he he actually bends the cage, you know what I mean? But one time for TV, I walked in and it had my name against Stan Hansen. I said, Ole, come here. I took my pen out, scribbled it, said "fuck you," <laughs> wrote his name in there. I ain't working with Stan Hansen. Are you kidding me? He might accidentally hurt me. Ain't no fucking way. But I work with Vader and had a hell of a match and got him over and uh, showed all these guys, they were all, everybody was scared to death of him. He didn't potato me once. He did everything I said. It was great, but I had a different, uh, I'd been around and the guys had conf. I said, look, I know what you can do. I'm not gonna make you look bad. I will do my best to get you over. I'm not trying, I'm not paid to get over. I'm paid to get you over. I got no fucking ego. It ain't real when you win. It ain't real when you lose. I'm just blessed. I don't have to work at Walmart or McDonald's, and I'm getting to do this phony shit for how many how many years, traveling around, seeing the world, and that's all I ever wanted to do. Just coach, put me in. I'm the last man in the NFL. Put me on the bomb squad. Let me protect the punter. Put me in as an extra. Just let me in there. I'll give it my best. And that's where I was in wrestling. Did you have much interaction with Sid? Oh, here's a funny Sid story. Sid was money, appearance, and I have no idea if he was really tough. I have no idea, but he gave the illusion. He had those eyes, the mannerisms that he could kill you. You know what I mean? But one, he he was picking on some green boys one time, just fucking with them. And I was I had sort of I would be known as sort of being like crazy. So they used to have these Metarex candy bars. And I had a chocolate one, so I acted like I pulled my pants down, shit my hand, and I pulled that candy bar out and smashed it, it looked like a turd. So I'm chasing him down the hall. He's, he's crazy, he's crazy, he's crazy. It's all a rib, right? But you do stuff just to entertain yourself and whatever, and it's all a rib anyway. And if not, guys would fuck with you and do shit to you. But uh, he drew money, you know what I mean? And. Uh, uh, was a hell of a physical presence. You're not asking him to do, uh, just do what you're good at. You know, if you're, if you're whatever, baby, whatever you do, cater to their strengths, stay away from your weaknesses, make them look the best you fucking can. Now you mentioned you were running uh, some house shows for the development territory of mm -hmm. WCW. I know Bill Watts started that program uh, with the power plant and everything. Do you think if he had been in power longer, he could have turned the company around? Because I heard that it almost made money the, the year that he had taken over. Well, he took two steps back and went back to basics. And the stuff he was doing, the guys, older guys understood it. They, had, they did the top rope rule. Why? Because if you come off the top, now it, mean, now it was so devastating, they would do carryouts with it. If the heel would come off the top when the ref was down, the bet they'd carry. He come off the top rope. He make everything. He, now all of a sudden we got rules. It's not like ECW where there wasn't any rules. You know what I mean? Now he made guy. He made stuff simple. The fans could buy it. He treated it as a sport. He had Jim Ross commentate, doing play by play. They weren't talking about diva search or this or that, expose the business. They're talking about like this is a real, this is a Indiana versus Purdue game. This is a Notre Dame versus Southern Cal. This is Michigan against Ohio State football. Electricity in the air, it's a contest. It's a fight. People didn't know how much it was bent, how much it wasn't. They didn't know. They thought they knew. But now nobody cares. Beach balls going, wrestling blow up dolls, having intergender matches, total fucking horseshit. I'm old, I'm old school, and I'm gonna die old school, and that's the way it is. You can't convince me, no. If a, a, a real guy wrestles a real girl, it's gonna be over in a matter of seconds. That's it. The guys are bigger, stronger, faster. That's the way it is. And what about this Joey Ryan stuff that I've, I guess he was charging people $50 to grab his dick and take pictures at well, WrestleCon. <laughs> I can't get on somebody that loves the business. I can't get on anybody that works on any way to make money because that's the object. I don't agree with it. 
I kept saying, oh, I don't want to watch it. I get mad. Because, hell, I was still protecting the business for how many years? You know what I mean? And that's just me because I'm old. Uh, I can't get mad. And in the wrestling match, it's like the buffet. Each match should be a different, a different entree. This is hamburger. Here's fish. Here's chicken. Here's tuna salad. You know, here's uh, 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 steak. Here's roast beef, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I want a good technical match. I want a baby face match. I want a lucha match because I don't, I don't like it. But that doesn't mean this paying customer don't like it. We want to have every. Where's the circus coming to town? I don't want ten bearded ladies. I want one bearded lady. I want one giant. I want one midget. I want one freak doing this. I want one fire eater. You know what I mean? One sword swaller. One of everything. Well, that's a hell of a show. I came here to see the sword swaller. I came here to see the lucha match. I came here to see the hardcore match. And we give them that nice fucking product. Well, hell, we're just looking at bottom dot line. We want bottom dollar. We want to make goddamn money. If everybody's diving, a dive don't mean nothing. If everybody has, if everybody's doing a DDT and it don't mean nothing, years ago, uh, if this guy was a sleeper, nobody else attempted a sleeper. Unless you just bring somebody in to work sleeper versus sleeper. DDT versus DDT. No, that's his hole. That's Jake's. Fuck, uh-uh. You don't do that. No. I said, oh, no, no. Uh, I used to do, uh, have wrestling. I had one, only one guy was allowed to do a clothesline. That was it. One guy. And anybody else, and then whenever he did it, it was a knockout, a 10 count, or a referee stoppage. What we do? We sold each other. We made it simple. We'd have two guys, the Battle of the Sunset Flippers. <laughs> I have the world's greatest sunset flip. No, I do. It's a double leg crucifix anyway. You know. <laughs> but you just take basics and sell each other. So I guess you met Jim Cornette uh, in one of your Georgia runs or early runs. I'm from Seymour, career. Indiana. I grew up on Louisville wrestling. Okay. I've known Jimmy since he was a teenager. We was business partners in OVW together. I trained all the WWE guys when they were developmental. He did all the TVs and the interviews. Saw him every day. He's about the only guy I agree with in this business on everything. The only reason, it, but the thing is, is he can say it so articulate, and I just say, well, that's fucking stupid, you know, <laughs> where he can emphasize why it's stupid. But he's, I never seen a guy so smart in wrestling for not being a performer. I see. You know what I mean? And. Uh, but as far as laying shit out, Jesus Christ, knowing his shit, which is guys, now, if you wrestled 20 years, it's like promotion. If you wrestled 20 years, you know how to be a promoter and you learn by mistakes. Now the promotions are tax check guys, television executives, somebody that has nothing to do with wrestling, but now they're running shows, they're running, running in a network or whatever the hell it is. You know, they're not real wrestlers. It ain't Eddie Graham running shit, Ole running shit, Watts running, the stuff we was talking about with the territories. Yeah. Rougeau's running stuff in Montreal or, or, or what, whatever it is with this and that. And I probably veered off the question again that you asked me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to guess you were probably there that night that Jim had his incident with the boogeyman. In OVW. Uh, I, I was there earlier and I'd left. Okay. But... Uh, I heard Lance Storm said Boogeyman was pretty much untrainable. <laughs> Is that uh... well? It's the like, how did he look? Great. He did the worm gimmick or whatever. Everything was great till the bell rang. But you can work around that. You know what I mean? But he was a unique character, that's for sure. Would I have the foresight to do all that shit with him? No. <laughs> so, uh, but. But I was there, and everybody's got different stories and stuff. And any story, somebody will keep changing and changing and changing. And by the yeah. end of, by the end of the room, it's a completely different story, you know. What's your craziest Jim Cornette story? That uh, something you've witnessed? Well, Jimmy's Jimmy. He's passionate. He loves wrestling. How can I get mad at somebody? And I, I think I agree with him with everything he says. But if I didn't agree with him, how could I get mad when he's got a passion and believe? If you believe in what you do, how can I get mad at him? We just got a difference of opinion. 
I just think it this way and you think it that way. But I seen him take them ball bats and bash out windows and bash out the walls and shit like that. And, and I was scared he was always going to have a heart attack and shit. He'd get, I could see his face getting red, blood pressure, whatever. And I'm surprised he's made it this far. <laughs> <laughs> he gets so passionate and so emotional about this shit. But he's a smart motherfucker about traditional wrestling. And that's all I like. So, uh, I haven't watched wrestling on TV since 2002. Stuff that I get, people will send me on the phone to get me wound up, you know what I mean? And, but I don't watch, I don't watch, really watch TV and, and I haven't watched wrestling since 2002. That way I can't get, I can't get mad. That's like when I had uh, uh, I had you, Nick Dinsmore, down at OVW, and I said, Nick, they don't, they won't even look at you as a wrestler. They don't give a shit. And that's just the way it was. I said, now, what if we did this? And I told him the basics of it. And I said, here's the idea. It was the Eugene character, right? So, and I said, do this, and then we'll swap ideas, and then come down with that solid game plan of how you want to do it. I said, you'll probably have this much shelf life. But then we're going to have to beat you up, and then you're going to go through rehab. When you come back, you're sort of like you now. You're normal. You know what I mean? You're not you're not a retard anymore. But what you are is when they hit you, then you sort of lapse back. You know what I mean? Until you come out of it and stuff. But you can eventually evolve into an other character. Which how many guys in the, well, what was Bret Hart? Cowboy Bret Hart when he come in. Uh, how many guys would be different characters? A lot of times a third character, they'd be successful with it, right? They would change it around. Just throwing shit at the wall and see what's stuck and everything. But uh, uh, a lot of times what happens, in the, everybody loves you in the wrestling business until you start doing better than them. Yeah. So a lot of times the mentors would help the young guys, but then the young guys would get the job. And were the young guys any good? No. But it was a new face, it was just a body. Now they taught wrestling WWE. Now, well, here's your promos. You don't really have to know how to do them. Here's your match. You don't have to know how to work. We'll put you in the performance center. And now you're an athlete, so you're not like a real wrestler. So we'll treat you with baby steps. You know what I mean? And everybody's, ba it ain't no dick to bruiser, mad dog with Sean, guys with busted nose and cauliflower ears and torn biceps and, and you knew they was a tough son of a bitch. Beer drinking, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now everybody's a video game guy. 205 alive and they, 5'3 and they weigh 162, you know. But that's the way it is. Can I change it? No. So, but, but I, when I see stuff, I see stuff, and that's why I love 1940s black and white movies. Yeah. <laughs> and Rene Dupree, who we use in our Great North Wrestling Company pretty regularly, he wanted me to get you to talk about uh, some of your maritime experiences wrestling for his father. Well, it's like the first time I was there was, I was there in 78, 88. I was supposed to be there in 89, but Puerto Rico called me up to want me to come in there, so I worked Puerto Rico. And I said, well, I can't come because I'm doing too good here. You know what I mean? And, and then I was there in, let's see, 78, 88, 90, and then went back in 97. When he didn't have TV, I was there, Bad News was there, Edge was there, Christian was there, and he just ran ran in the summertime with posters. That when Glenn Coco was there Yeah, so, yeah Glenn, Glenn was there. Glenn was a good boy. He, he, he reminded me of like the barbarian sort of. He was looking about like that. He was, real, he was really jacked there. And he, and he was a nice guy, but, but he didn't have that fire, that competitive edge of, you know what I mean? But he was, he was laid back, good boy, you know, good, you know, did what he was told. He just didn't have, it was hard. And it's like tonight, it's hard now to get experience. You know, the big anything is you can get eight, if you can get eight matches a month. They said, I've worked 10 years. I said, yeah, 10 years, 10 matches against guys of your skill set, so you can't learn nothing. Well, I was taught, hell, I've been working with Randy Orton's grandpa. You know what I mean? So, in the car every night, learning, they're telling you how to do this, and all the old veterans would basically tell you the same thing, maybe different terminology. And you get over to England, and they're doing the, basically the same thing. They're going Germany, it's a little bit different. They're basically doing this. They sell and come back. Treat each other like it's real. Don't do so much. Live to, say, live to see another day. You've only got so many bumps on your bump card. Then you're done. You know what I mean? 
how these kids half kill themselves. We're diving off of a roof and they meant they're killing themselves for a fucking hot dog and twenty dollars. The hell's the matter with them? Oh, I want to get so many hits and so many likes on it. Oh shit, fucking Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your favorite feud from the Maritimes? God, I worked with Leo a lot. Leo was the easiest. And this was this is a funny story because I was working for Stu in Calgary. It's like in 1988, I, I didn't even work in the States. 89, I didn't work in the States. 92, most of the year, I didn't work in the States. But I, was, I, I worked in South Africa, and then I come back and uh, worked for Stu Hart, which loved, oh God, loved working there. The most fun. Uh, I, I worked there like five months, and I went and worked for Baba, Then I come off that tour, went back to, uh, then went to the Maritimes, they had already started. Then I went back for Stu for the end of the year. But when I was in, I was in the Maritimes, uh, I stayed at the old Re St. Regis Hotel, had the, had the bathroom at the end of the, end of the, the hallway or whatever, or the fourth floor, whatever the hell it was, which was awesome, right downtown. And I'd jump on the, 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 the train and never paid and go to like four blocks down to BJ's gym, who was uh, married to uh, one of the older George sisters. Right, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I got to go to BJ's gym every day, love that. And then you had the free trans with the van. So, oh my God. And you're at the tit bar every night. Oh my God. So it was just a great, it was just the greatest time. And they had the long traditional wrestling shows. Hell, most of the guys were there. Hell, they're all dead now. Hell, Benoit was there. Johnny Smith was there. Jerry Moore drove the van. Uh, the Cuban, Gary Albright, Bad News was there. Uh, uh, Biff Wellington, Brute Pillman was there. Uh, Kerry Brown was there. I just had time of my life there. And they hated me at first because I was American. American took a Canadian boy's job, right? So by two weeks, I was leading the troops. <laughs> okay, boys, we're going out. This is where we're going, you know. Uh, oh, but anyway, back to the Maritimes. So uh, uh, Emil calls me up at the, at the hotel. Did we talk about this on the last one about, he called me up, he says, oh, Rip Rogers, Emil Dupre. Hello, Emil, how you doing? No. You still married to Paula? Are you still with Paula? What, what are you talking about? And I said, you don't know who I am. He goes, yeah, you're Rip Rogers. I saw you on TSN and Leo told me to call you because he wanted to work with you in the Maritimes. I said, no, I'm Hercules Samard. He goes, holy Jesus. I said, boy, I was a fucking shits, wasn't I? <laughs> he goes, yes, but you got a lot better. <laughs> so I come out to the Maritimes and blah, 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 blah. Wow. But I had Renee there at, uh, at OBW when he got signed by WWE. And he was on, and he was on the gas, looked great had a man's boy, a man's body with a boy's brain. And the guys are treating him like he's 35 years old. Hell, he's a teenager. You can't get to it, you know what I mean? Emotionally, he's a teenager, it wasn't fair. So they'd fuck with him and do shit with him and everything and he'd take it out by, he had to almost be a loner and do other shit. But I, oh, I loved her. Now, hell, he was like 14 or 15 when I was there the last time in the Maritimes. This skinny little kid, you know, and then he's Mr. Whatever the hell he was and whatever. And we still talk every, every once in a while with this and that. And then, well, hell, he had that good run with Mood over in Japan and stuff right there. And but we was getting in the maritime. But anyway, so I, uh, I'd work with Leo all the time. And Leo was just the easiest guy to work with. Nothing but basics. Just sell and come back. And then uh, I would have uh, a lot of times I'd take the uh, the baby faces and I'd go an hour or like almost an hour, and I'd use it for cardio because I was into fitness. I'd use that thing to just to break a sweat and uh, f feeling good, right? And in the Maritimes, I called it like America's 1950. A lot of two lanes, you ran the same towns. You had a. Uh, uh, Berwick, Bridgewater, Antigonish, North Sydney, Cocan, uh, Moncton, St. John, Fredericton, Bob, you're going back to the same places. Drew big, and they were, the fans were passionate. It was so fucking easy there. And it, it was just great there. And it was never no problem with the prey. Here's your money, here's your, here's your money, right? And a lot of times you wouldn't even go to the show, and the bulldog would be booking a lot. And I'd ride with the bulldog all the time, so I'd get women in his car, and I'd make messes in his car. Oh, he'd get mad every night, and, and that was it was a rib. But uh, Maritime is a great place to work, uh, and uh, but most of my, the the best matches were with Leo. He had so much experience. He was just you know he could sell. He was there. The people, but most of the people believed in him. The people believed in him. 
which is, you know, they believe in him. I don't know, he flies, he does, okay. When you were in Stampede, I guess it would have been Bruce booking? Yes, yeah, Bruce was booking. So he, he, he had me uh, do sort of a queer, a little bit queer gimmick, you know. And he, we were, me and, we were, me and Kerry Brown were the Midnight Cowboys, which Kerry hated it because he was been there as, for years and going to Japan is like a tough guy. And so as a rib to Kerry, they had him wearing pink and everything. So I just treated it as a rib. It didn't matter. It, it ain't real. Get in, get out, have a good time. And Calgary was great. Yeah, Bruce. Pilman, I met Pillman there, you yeah. know. And, and in Pillman, I worked a lot on Pillman on TV. And I, have, and I didn't even know, Cornette told me, he was on the booking committee and stuff there. And he said, I got like banned from TV for a while because my matches were too good. On st in Stampede? No, this is on, uh, this uh, is for WCW. Okay. Because like, Pillman, uh, he, then he got into WCW. And I, had, and I had had like three straight shows with him on TV and just destroyed. It was so fucking good. Well, we're just having a good time. I just love wrestling. He was wrestling. I said, hit me hard, beat the shit. Let's be fucking snug out there. Make him believe this some bitch. At the end, he'd win. You know what I mean? But it was a goddamn contest, you know? And uh, he was a good boy. But yeah, Bruce was booking, and, and I've been on his Heartbeat Radio show a bunch. I talked to him yesterday, because Bob Johnson got him on the phone. So I was talking to Bruce. So uh, uh, Bruce had a lot of good creative ideas. And they had all them Hart brothers, and they were all polar opposites. It was just awesome. Now, each one was, was so different. And, everything. and I saw Ross here, the thing, and then David Schultz was talking, and, there was, and Ross was there, and Bob Johnson was sitting in front of me and everything. And, uh, but I loved my time in cat. There ain't a place I didn't not like working at. I just love being in the wrestling business. You know, what's your position? Well, okay, be main event. Okay, if that's what you want. Be a baby face. Okay, if that's what you want. Can you do tag? I can do anything you want. And if you don't like it, tell me what you do want and I'll change it. This ain't real. <laughs> and do you have a Stu Hart impression? Every... And, uh, 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 Hannibal, you, you, you big fucking bat, you fucking stud, you motherfucker. Oh, shit. Anyway, uh, but I think he, uh, when I was uh, in the uh, uh, wrestling... Uh, 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 the bit, uh, yeah, he was the uh, uh, the most uh, uh, goddamn it. Uh, anyway, he was the most imitated guy. Every I never heard one bad word about Stu Hart. Everybody loved fucking Stu Hart. <coughs> he was the most imitated guy in wrestling. Would you go over there for the Sunday dinners ever? Oh no, oh no. I, I was busy. I was a uh, get in trouble guy. Really? Not, not, I didn't expect that out of you. No, no, I mean, no, get in trouble guy as far as females. So I, that's, you, you know the deal. So that was that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but I, I love fucking Stu. And we'd be doing promos at Friday night, right? And all of a sudden, I hear, hey, hey, come here, you best. And he's trying to hook some nachos on the floor. There's part of a hot dog. He's going to get it and get that last bite. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> and he always paid me, even though they weren't doing good. This is when Vin supposedly bought him out, made a couple payments. They stopped. They started back, right? Yeah. And uh, worked for him. And Stu always paid me more than my guarantee. Never heard him raise his voice, you know, and was just just awesome to work for. I see. And at what point did you stop working for WCW? Really, I was working for them in 95, and we was working Orlando. So some girls coming in, we were eating, and they was trying to pick up and hustle what on us, right? So I went into a, like a gay character and said something about her boyfriend that I wasn't interested in him. I wanted a younger, more attractive man or whatever, and I'm just totally fucking ribbon, right? Then all of a sudden, they beat a big fucking stinko about it. And Kevin Salva says, did you say that? I said, well, hell yeah, I said it. You know I'd say that. Hell yeah, it's my goddamn routine. What the fuck? They fucking fired me. And then I, and then once they did that, I basically said, fuck you. I don't, don't want to go back here anyway now. Just because you treat me like a fucking Mark. I said, uh, I'm ribbing somebody. I'm ribbing some fucking Marks that are obviously trying to get attention or, or do whatever, blah, blah, blah. And we got some of the other boys trashing rooms, not paying for their food in Orlando, just walking by. You know what I mean? 
and, she, and here I am fucking ribbing having a good time in a working way. But, but hell, today you couldn't say anything anyway. No. Fuck. And everything I say is against what you... Hell, if they had them phones in, I'd been fire, fired in five minutes. Yeah. Doing everything goddamn wrong. Uh, did you do all this? Yeah. And people tell stories. Did you do this? Yeah. Did you do this? Yeah. Did you just... No, that's hell. They made that shit up. No, don't credit me with that. You know. I think most of the big wrestling stars from the 80s and 90s would not have been able to get a contract today no. with the drug testing and cell phones. And they would like Piper and Flair probably wouldn't have lasted because with cell phones, there, some of their antics would get out there. Well, well, uh, it's like in a wrestling business. Some people make one mistake. You're, they get rid of you for 10 years. Yeah. Some people can do everything else and do everything that's worse and they get away with it. It's all it's the world. Like Shawn Michaels, it, for instance. It, it's and, all who you know, yeah. right? I mean, that's the way the world is. Yeah. We know the world ain't fair. Hell you're what, six foot four? Yeah. Two eighty, whatever? Hell I'm lucky to be five foot nine and a half. Weigh two hundred fucking pounds. You know, you're a real fucking shooter. Fuck! I couldn't beat my grandma. Get real. I was an enter entertainer before I was admit to being an entertainer, right? Right. I did my best, though. Yeah. But nobody said life is fair. Yeah. Okay, how do you get booked? Well, you're, uh, you're related to one of the Samoans, right? Yeah. <laughs> or you're uh, 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 the, the something, you know somebody, this or that. You're on a reality show or whatever. You got some kind of notoriety. Uh, 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 you're an ex-football player or whatever. But it's their business. They can do what the hell they want to do. Just because I... Fuck. How about it? every armchair quarterback knows more than the coach who spent his whole life coaching, works 20 hours a day, sees these guys every day in practice, but oh, no, fire the coach. Yeah, all right, okay. You don't come to McDonald's and judge your job on how to make Big Macs. Yeah. <laughs> and how did you get into business with Jim Cornette with uh, OVW? Well, uh, I was business partners with Danny Davis. Okay. And then Jim come in and got the, the developmental deal. Danny was teaching, and then he had so much stress with running that shit, he had little health problems. So I just took over there, so I ran, so I ran it down there. And uh, nobody from the office never come down to watch me do anything. I just did it. Basically, leave me alone, and I, I don't know what to do. And I never taught anybody in my life. Never went to a wrestling school, right? But now I am in charge of all these guys. What I do, the best I could, trial and error. You know what I mean? And they had all them girls down there, which is horrible. We got every testosterone guy with these hot women. So now, class, how can you do it? Because the guys want the girls, the girls want the guys, the girls want fucking drama. Holy shit. And I'm supposed to get this product of fucking wrestling. Oh, man. But checks never bounced. Money was always there. What the hell, right? Yeah. Take your run because you're, you're, you're born. Count down till you die. Don't know what's going to happen. You get a job within. You're hired. Count down till you be fired. Every second, you're blessed. Thank you very much. Have a good time because you're going to get fired. It could basically be for no reason. That's the way. You had your run. You had your, your chance. Did live every, live, every, live uh, every minute. Did your pay go up when it became a development territory? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. And it, it was great. Hell, I had to, had to I, I was in Indianapolis, and I drove to Louisville every day. Then after a while, I had walking pneumonia and didn't do it, and I fucking almost croaked. So I had to get a house in Louisville. Well, that was, oh, that was, and then, and they didn't, they wouldn't give me no insurance. I had an autistic son, needed health insurance. I had had to work at UPS to get health insurance, okay? And then I, then I had the, the health issues from too much travel and, and the other fucking jobs. So I'm working with stuff 18 hours a day, you know what I mean? Eventually it catches up with you. And trying to train too, you know, it eventually catches up with you. So, but anyway, uh, whatever the question was, I probably... We, so your pay went up? So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There was no issues with pay. Okay. There was no issues with pay. Did you have any hand in Batista's training? In what? Uh, training Batista. 
Yeah, but he was basically in and out, and he was there, Brock, Cena, and a lot of these other guys. Uh, he was already on his way up. Right. It's like Jimmy made him the demon of the deep, great fucking character, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, hell, Brock, Brock was driving a ring truck. I remember the first night in, we was running to town in Free, Freetown, Indiana. Cena's just happy, putting the ring up, whistling. Jack, happier than fuck, he's getting a chance to be a pro wrestler. Brock, driving a ring truck, big old stud. I think Brock's equal opportunity. He hated everybody, it was great. <laughs> just aggressive alpha male. Holy moly, what an athlete. Can you imagine getting into pro football? You never played a, a college football? Yeah. That was wow. Impressive. And then, even though you was an amateur champion, now going into UFC, which is totally different, right? And, and I don't care, become the champion. Holy shit. And then going back to, and having the health, and going back now, he's making all that money, but he's yeah. a draw. They wouldn't pay him that money unless he was worth it. Exactly. You know, he, nobody put a gun to his head and said, oh, you know, and why would you get mad at him if he's that good? Gee exactly. whiz. So you mentioned in our uh, short teaser interview some of the people you've trained. Could you, could you go through the list of, the, of well, the guys that have made the main roster? Well, the guys that made the main roster, but they were contract guys, yeah. they don't count. Okay. The guys that count are the guys like Mike Mondo, the Spirit Squad, Johnny Jeter, the Spirit Squad, uh, Serena, who teaches at the Performance Center, Eugene, who is a, a, a local guy with uh, uh, OVW, Rob Conway, who was a, who was a local guy, the, uh, the, the two Bashams who were local guys from Indiana, from Henryville and Seymour, New Albany, Indiana, and were OVW originals and stuff. These are the guys that come in through the doors, paid their own money, got their own dime to live a dream, and they get WWE uh, tryouts and contracts. How unbelievable is that? And then, and then I used to teach in the morning. Uh, after I got fired the first time, I had DCW. I had my own television show. I had 60 guys in that. I'd have Santino every morning. I'd, have a, I'd take my, my son to kindergarten. Then I'd come back to OVW. For, there would be JTG who walked in, got on a bus from Brooklyn when he was 17, 18 years old. Was with WWE for, for years and years and years. There was Shad Gaspard, uh, who, was, uh, who was his partner. There was Armando Estrada, Santino, uh, uh, Serena who teaches, and all these people would come in. Abraham Washington, he had a run there. All these guys that paid their own dime in the beginner's class, they became WWE superstars, living the goddamn dream. But I've got 65, 66 guys that went through the doors that weren't paid, that, that weren't Supposed to be, st I mean, you knew Brock was going to, they don't count. It's the guys that walk through the door, uh, the guys that made it as referees. Hell, uh, uh, Kenobi, what was his real, Matt, Matt, uh, what? Anyway, he was one of uh, uh, Triple H's right-hand man for at least five years or whatever. What a run, right? He wasn't a good referee or a good, real good wrestler, but he got in there. I told you, I said, I, said, I, I, I train uh, uh, girls, guys, wrestlers, ref, and stooges. I don't care. Get that goddamn check. Hang out in the business you goddamn fucking love. Jesus Christ. It's going to end, yes. Nothing lasts for fucking ever. You know what I mean? But the guys that walk through the door got on the fucking bus, come from different country, countries. Well, hell, Santino come in across the border from Canada. He couldn't work in the States unless he'd get a kayfabe cash job, right? He never had any money. And I tell them all, and they all come back, this is the best time of your life. Having no money, talking shit, playing wrestling, getting to hang out, learning the fucking business. And I said, you can have $10 million and die, but the best times of your life is going to be here at OVW learning. Hot guys, hot girls, trying it all, having the time of your life. Can't get any better than that. Do you have any stories about John Cena from those days? Well, let's just say uh, John, he could get any woman in the world he wanted. <laughs> He's over with me. <laughs> Speaking of that, what was the best town for uh, groupies? Uh, you've wrestled in a lot of territories. Well. Years ago, any town that you had a territory, 
It'd be like in Memphis, you come out, Louisville, you come out, Tampa, you come out, Orlando, you come out, Portland, you come out, Kansas City, you come out, San Juan, you come out. When you had the weekly towns, you'd come out after, there'd be 100 broads dressed to the fucking max, basically bidding on you. And this is when wrestling was wrestling. <laughs> and we could go into how many X-rated tapes of all that. Wow, but the names have been changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> and uh, uh, was I guilty of everything? Yes, I was. That's why I got hit, hit run over, karma. Uh, but would I, uh, would I do it again? Yes, would I change this thing? Hell no, fuck no. I love the wrestling business. What do you think about all these uh, cell phones that have been supposedly hacked in recent years with these female wrestler naked pictures coming out and other, not just naked pictures, but in some cases like pages and bizarre stuff? Well, as you know, I'm not Mr. Technology. Anything I do on the phone, I don't even know how to tag nobody. Yeah. I got a stuff on Facebook, but I don't know the password, user word, none of that stuff. I know how to put a little bit stuff up. On Twitter, I never tag nobody. You know what I mean? Anything I do is an accident. Now, I usually have to ask a five-year-old, how do I do this? <laughs> so I wouldn't last in today's thing. But as far as the hacking stuff, I have no idea. Hell, it's like my mom. She had a computer. She had a big old white or the big old flat screen TV and all that shit. And she couldn't turn it on. Didn't know how to. That's like me. I've never been on a computer in my life. Yeah. What the hell? Well, what did you love the most about being a heel? Uh, uh, this, is, this is any heel. The baby faces would get the food made for them. The mothers would throw their daughters at them. <laughs> they would get treated like fucking kings. The heels would get their tires slit, uh, the cops called on them, spit on, kicked trying to go to the ring, but, and the baby faces made the gimmick money, but there was nothing in the world like being a heel. And the fucking boos were better than the cheers. And being a baby face is the most boring motherfucking thing in the world. And when you're a heel and you can control that audience, Man, what a high that is, and it don't get any better than that. What led to uh, OVW no longer being a development territory for WWE? Well, they used to have a developmental. They had one in Memphis. They had one in Cincinnati. They had one in Atlanta. Blah blah blah. But we we were the we were the guinea pig for later. And what happened was what Danny and Cornet they said Johnny Ace didn't want to come to Louisville, boring Louisville, right? He wanted to come, he lived in Tampa, whatever, so he wanted to move the thing to Tampa first so he could go out the door and he could be there, right? Because he hated coming to Louisville and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, lo and everything in life's location, 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 isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's what we think, that's what we think it was, but nobody really knows, you know. And how did you like when uh, Impact Wrestling, I think it was, I don't know, it's changed names so many times, but I think it was still TNA at that time was a development territory. What was different when it was TNA compared to WWE? Well, uh, TNA, I taught, their guy, I had Spudsy there, uh, a lot of their guys was there down, the girls was there, and I would be teaching them, but they're supposed to send so much money to train, they wouldn't do it. Hell, they might be six weeks behind or something. So uh, I wasn't getting paid for teaching their guy, you know what I mean? So uh, I asked them a couple times to, uh, uh, if, uh, if they could, if they, it was their choice to, to pay me for training them because I wouldn't get no money from the office. So they paid me and then somebody made a big deal about it. So then they fired me, you know? And I said, well, and basically fuck you too, assholes. You know what I mean? But they were the bad guys, not me. If I tell you, when I run shows, as soon, if you got a, you got a guarantee coming in, as soon as you walk through the door, here's your money, Hannibal. If no people show up, here's your money, Hannibal. If 10,000 people show up, here's your money, Hannibal. But I, I have the option to bonus you, but here's your guarantee for coming in. I'm taking the chance. And, and running the show on your own, oh my God, I'm doing it. You're nervous as shit. And you might win, you might lose, but you can't wait to do it again the next time. Because you're addicted to the fucking wrestling. How do you feel about the lack of selling in modern wrestling? That's on WWE. Everything in this business is on WWE. They're the leaders of the industry. If I'm a young man trying to break in, I'm gonna copy my heroes. 
Right now, I'm going to be LeBron James. Who are the, uh, the top quarterbacks, the running backs? For me, I wanted to be Jimmy Brown, Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris. I wanted to be Dr. J or whatever. And whatever, I wanted to be Gordy Howe, depending on what sport it is. Now, if, in pro wrestling, I wanted to be Dick the Bruiser. I wanted to be Vern Gagne. I wanted to be Bruno Sammartino. These are the stars. So if they're seeing this, your heroes, you're emulating your heroes. Is what it, so I can't get mad at them. They've never seen selling. They don't, they don't know what it is. I just know that if you get on YouTube, you can feel the, the electricity of a match, and it's night and day. There ain't no beach balls going around. There ain't nobody screaming, this is awesome. You're like this, going, oh my God, I hope that baby, oh my God, he's hurt, oh my God. I hope he wins. Holy shit, oh my God. Now, oh, it's a rib. Oh, well, we got to get your 10 shit. You got to take your dive in. Oh, we got to get 10 false finish. We got to get 10. And everyone's got to be a two and nine tenths count. Fuck you. Jesus Christ. And we, we, we destroyed our business. They destroyed it. Everybody follows the leader. If they got on TV and started doing things old school, you'd take two steps back and then people would start liking it more. They would turn it back on more. But if you're catering to kids, like I guess they are, hell, it's got to be a cartoon. They don't care about the house show business, do they? They make more money with these great, hey, these guys are the world's greatest guys for making money. Hell yeah. Who is the biggest drinker out of all the wrestlers you encounter? Oh, my God. When I was with Nick Goulas, I got to carry Andre around in a, in a, in a van, the shell van with the mattress, and, and then he'd just get all that beer. But when I broke in, everybody was about drink. I didn't drink. Everybody smoked dope. I didn't do dope. Uh, everybody would do, uh, let's see, uh, cigarettes, beer, marijuana. And I never really seen guys do coke before. It wasn't me. I trained. You know what I mean? And then, now when I went to Germany, uh, we, we had to contact, we're, like we were in Hanover 70 days in a row. We're there 70 days in a row, you can only train so much. So I started taking the, the Jack and Jills, the pills, the downers, because I was bored. And then Regal taped me on the phone, I'm going, I'm slurring, rah, rah. he goes, you're a drug addict. I am not. He, play, he showed me that fucking, I listened to that tape, I threw that shit away and never did it again. You know what I mean? You do it, he didn't even know about it. Yeah. But uh, the drinkers, I don't know, the ones that, who didn't drink? Who didn't smoke cigarettes or smoke dope? Who didn't, you know, I, I didn't, that wasn't my thing. Hell, when I was 16, I took a puff and said, oh my God, this is horrible. And you pay money for this? What the hell's the matter with you? You know, if I could drink, oh, I probably had three, three beers in my life total. Now, I could drink immense quantities of vodka <laughs> mixed with uh, Hawaiian punch and play cards all night and do a set between each hand. <laughs> I could do that, but uh, uh, as far as with the women, uh, guilty as charged, but the other stuff, no, it wasn't me. Do you think it's possible that wrestling might have a resurgence? Oh, hell yeah. yeah. It's for how many hundred? It, up, down, up, down, up, down. There's always new young people. There's no always new old people. Okay. All you got to do is hook them. All you got to do is hook them. What do you think the main thing uh, is that AEW is going to have to do? Well, now just think back. Here's Vince. How did Vince make all of his money? wrestling. He went off to the XFL. Within four weeks on television, it started here, it went halvesies, it went halvesies, it went down, 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 down. By four weeks you knew it was over. Now we got the other guy, god damn he got the big fucking arms, Jesus Christ, Hannibal. <laughs> 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 now we got a, a NFL owner that's got way, 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 way more money than uh, WWE. And it's his money, he can piss it, he can burn it, it's his money. And if I had that money, I'd want to have it, I'd want to make my kid happy too. It's my money. He can do that. Now they got guys in office positions that have no idea about being office positions. You don't just born into an office position. You know what I mean? You evolve into that after working so many styles, being under, they're going to do stuff. And today's wrestling fan, they'll turn on them just like they do everything. Wrestling stands are butt hurt about everything. 
the wrestlers. Can you imagine you wrestle? You, your whole dream is to get in WWE. Then all of a sudden, you you don't like your push. I don't know a goddamn uh, wrestler phone that told you the truth, really, except Ole and Watts. Get real. You got a chance to be on WWE TV, make this money, go beyond your fondest dreams, be good for comic cons, conventions. Hell, Honky Tonk's still making money on weekends. Jesus Christ, you get a chance to do this. They can take anybody in the world and make you a star. This is not real. We can take any girl give you a hair color, give you the nails, oh she needs boobs, here's the con, do these moves, moves, and move, that's it. Get you over, make a star out of anybody, no matter how good or bad you are, and you're complaining about your push. Well honey, it's your job to be in a waiter then, or a waitress, or whatever. There ain't many places to go anymore. Be happy you got that goddamn job, milk it, stay there, save all your goddamn money, and be a fucking star for fucking ever. Oh, I, oh, I, and and you're a mark if you're worried about a goddamn belt. Get fucking real. When Randy Savage says, "You know, I'm the champion." I said, "Oh, you're the best." He said, "Oh, my daddy owns it." Get real. This ain't real when you win. It ain't real when you lose. Have a good time with the character. Do the best you can. Work hard. Do the business right. Do the way it's supposed to be done. Don't think of yourself. Do what what the office asks you to do, and you'll have a long career, and you'll be happy. Don't worry about the politics, you can't change it anyway. That's the same in every job. Don't worry about it. Do the best you can and try and smile and laugh. Because when you're on your goddamn deathbed, you're going to think, what a good time I had in fucking wrestling. Boy, I fucked that up with a stupid attitude. And that's the way it is. Who is your toughest opponent? That's like, that's, that's the question of who's, some guy said, who's the strongest guy you ever worked in a ring? I said, I don't know, they're all fucking phony. He didn't put no pressure on me to test the strength. When I was getting slammed, I was press slamming myself. Get real, you fucking Mark, you know. <laughs> but who was my toughest, my, who's, who's the hardest guy to work with, you mean? Or what do you mean? Uh, it's a fan question. But oh, let's, okay. Let's, let's say who's the hardest guy to work with. In that oh point. my God. Like, I worked with Ox Baker. And I drew a lot of money with Ox Baker because I knew what he could do. I'm not asking him to do very much. When you're, I got to play to your strengths. I, get, I make you look as good as you can. I got to highlight you and you got to hate me and I got to make you uh, love that goddamn baby face. I'm not going to make him look stupid. I want to make this guy look like the greatest professor wrestler that he can. And I don't watch WWE, so I don't know what this fan is talking about, but they're asking you what you think about the race card being played in WWE storylines in recent years. Well, the race card is how you made money in wrestling. And just think, the race thing or whatever, you can't do anything you do. It was like the American against the evil German from World War II, the evil Russian. When Iron, the, the Iran, Iraq thing or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It was the good, it was cowboy versus Indi, good guy against bad guy. Uh, race thing, they would tar and feather guys years ago. There, there would be racial slurs and all the, the fans would be yelling that shit all the time. Race has always been in, hey, quit kidding yourself. People are the most, they're worse and worse now than they ever are. They just don't let it be seen. Get real. Don't be a fucking mark in the world. But anyway, what are they doing on TV? I have no idea. But it's PG. No matter what it is, it's P it can't be that. Everybody's butt hurt over anything. You can't, I said, hey, you fat bastard. Oh, you can't call him fat. What? Well, you lazy, oh, you can't call him lazy. Oh, everybody's gotta have a goddamn participation fucking trophy. I got 42nd in the goddamn Shelbyville Entertational. How many were there? 43, but I got my trophy. Shit, I was, throw, I was throwing trophies away because they're second place. Fuck, what a pussy I am. I got to work harder. Jesus fucking Christ. Was Ox Baker's heart punch stiff? Uh, no. It's a total, for, it's a total work love. <laughs> and is it true Batista got into a behind the scenes fight when he was in OVW? Uh, I think he did with Slick Robbie D. Yeah. I'm thinking so. Did I see it? No. 
Slick Robbie D had the vertical jump record at Fresno State. Slick Robbie D was a tough motherfucker. Slick Robbie D was a great amateur wrestler. Slick Robbie D was one of the coolest motherfuckers you'd ever want to fucking meet. And talking about the race thing, Slick Robbie D went out to fucking, when he went, I think it was in California. They said he made some trouble and he sm and all of a sudden he, he hung himself. That wasn't Slick Robbie D. He was the most confident man, nice guy. We would walk in, he would be sitting there uh, at the basketball thing where you go work in a lot of high school gyms. I'd say, Bob, Robbie, do it now. I'd throw him a basketball. He could take no steps. He'd jump up with no steps, dunk it over his head backwards. And then he'd go back to sitting down with no warm up. Wow. He was just, oh, he, he did the leapfrog with the big show. <laughs> Because Big Show was down there. Yeah. What was that fight about over uh, Batista's then girlfriend or something? I don't right. know because uh, Robbie, <laughs> Robbie, Robbie had a, had a, had a, he had quick wit and he was a smart ass. You know what I mean? Yeah. And these all these guys were all alpha males. Hell, Brock would be shooting with no neck kick and uh, 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 Eric Angle, Kurt's brother, and uh, uh, the Predator. What the hell was it? Sylvester Turkai. Sylvester Turkai. These were great. And they wanted to shoot. Ron Waterman was down there, right? Yeah. All these guys. I said, boys, quit doing that shit. We got to fucking learn how to make money and not get hurt. You guys could get hurt and fuck yourself up, you know? Why didn't Sylvester Turkai uh, have a better career in WWE? Hey, uh, uh, in any job, if the boss likes you, you're in. If I own... Any, if I'm the boss, I can hire you to be a head chef even though you can't boil water because you're my uh, next door neighbor's cousin. And that's it. You don't have to be right. You just got to do, if a boss likes you, you're in. If not, you're out. And that's the way it is. They can make a star out of anybody. They can manipulate. They know. If I sh uh, we could have had the invisible man on 99 straight weeks and he keeps beating people. Finally, people, they got uh, the visible man's over. He's a champ. They can make a star out of anybody. Did you ever work with Buzz Sawyer? Oh my God, Buzz. Buzz was a great worker. And a lot of times we would be on tour with Ole and I'd work with Tommy and Buzz would be coming out. That meant Tommy would pass out drunk in the dressing room. And Buzz was, Buzz was a great athlete. He was a great worker. He was sort of a bully, but he was always nice to me, and that's all I can go by. But he was so talented. Jesus Christ, he, he was great. He wasn't all there in the head, but he was, he was a great wrestler. And how is Al Snow at running OVW compared to Jim Cornette? Well, Danny always ran the thing. Danny was the boss, but Danny said, but Danny had the thing. He was running it in the 90s, way, way, way before I, I went in with him. Uh, Al's trying different things. He's got a combine coming up. He's doing some stuff with Impact. We had actually had an Impact pay-per-view over there. We ran some boxing shows there. They used to have MMA stuff in there. He's doing a lot of extra stuff, throwing some stuff against the wall. He's going to find out that some stuff works and some stuff. Does, but he's not scared. He's not scared to try new things, put it that way. And he's got the new thing where he's got OBW, the only wrestling school. It's an accredited school now where you can actually get school loans to go there. I think it starts up, I think, in May or something. But you're not going to have any real business until after you graduate from high school. Because you've got to be 18 years old and stuff to get in there, which means you're going to graduate from high school probably. And then, uh, you can, but you can get a loan to go, to go to wrestling school now. Do you have any funny stories about Al Snow? He's a popular subject on this channel. Well, everybody's got uh, stories about Al, so you don't need to. But, but Al's got a hell of a fucking story. Jesus Christ, when he went to Oldies and got on the bus, and him and Gene beat him up and run him to death, and he was a teenager. I remember he come into uh, ICW TV when he was probably about 18, 19 years old. He come, he got in the ring with Ronnie Garvin, and they messed something up. So, oh, you know Garvin. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, Al's paid his fucking dues, hung out, hell, trained guys, MMA stuff, tough stuff with Dan Severn. Uh, has been around, credit to the business, and uh, what can you say? And you mentioned Ronnie Garvin, and you mentioned before that uh, Bob Roop you drove with a little bit. What do you think about this Plan B video? Oh, wow. It's been about six weeks ago. The first time in my life I ever saw it. 
Now, do I personally? I thought it was all a bluff. They would never turn on the business. They wanted. Now they're working everybody. They wanted. To, they wanted the promoters think they would, and destroy their fucking Shangri La. But they. I, I can't see them doing it. Never. Especially these guys that were so far, you know, when uh, uh, Bob worked as a policeman for Eddie fucking Graham, right? When Garvin, when we had to wrestle in school, Garvin would just stretch all the fucking, the guys, and they would run away. He said, they don't, fuck them. They need to be in the first row paying ringside. Fuck these assholes. Guys would fucking piss their pants, shit their fucking pants. Oh, I'm afraid he's going to kill some of them. You know what I mean? He'd run them all off. Yeah. So you think they just sent, like, I guess that was during the time there was the territory war with Ron Yes, Ford. it was. And, and when they got in ICW, they found out all about promotion. And he really wasn't screwing them. You have expenses. You're paying for insurance. You're paying for building. You're paying for posters. You're paying for newspaper. You're paying for maintenance on this, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Once they got in the promoter's business, they saw we drew up and we barely broke even. Oh. oh. So they said, Rupe Orton, they went off to Watts, right? Said, fuck this. You know, we need, we need to be the boys again where we can have a good time, get drunk, and wrestle and get guaranteed money. You know, fuck. Fucking Angelo was pulling in. For a while there, we was doing bad. And you had to fucking, he was pulling out every fucking week to make payroll, pay the bills. Then stuff started going good. You know what I mean? But it was cyclable and stuff like that. But I don't know how we got on that. What was the question? <laughs> it, was, it was about uh, what do you think their intention was with that? Because Ron Fuller oh, yeah. said he never actually saw the video yeah. until then. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see it until, uh, what, the last month? Whatever, yeah. when, it, when it first came out, right? And I was, like, shocked. And yeah. I said, no, these guys are too smart. No, they ain't, uh, they're not going to they're gonna pit, not gonna piss in their own backyard. There ain't no way. Right. They're like, nah. Because they guys have made all their money all their life. They know this this business. They know this craft. They know how to, they're going to work the workers is what they're going to do. Okay. I, in my mind, that's what I believe, and that's all I can go by. And I said, no, they are no, they're working you. They're ribbing. They are not going to do that. And I'm guessing you worked for Ron Fuller probably at some point. I work that. I worked with Ron Fuller uh, after I left ICW. I worked for Watts. I worked for after that. Then I worked for, uh, I was there 11 months in Southeastern. Yeah. The next time I come back and work with Adrian Street for six months. Oh, wow. After I worked with Adrian for six months, I left. Why? I said, well, I can't top this. Right away, we shot Angle first night. We was off and running. Fuller said, we'll run this till, uh, till it's done. He'd, he'd said, here's some fucking ideas. Give me some of yours. And he might fine tune it. He said, no, we did this here and this time. We did this with this guy. He was a goddamn walking encyclopedia. You can't get no fucking farter, smarter than the goddamn Fullers. They've been at this longer than everybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Gee, I remember one night we was in Montgomery, Alabama, though. And uh, Ron Fuller, he come in. And the first match was on. He said, uh, uh, Rip, I don't want to go over there. He said, could you explain to those boys how to have a, they went out in the first match and did every fucking thing you could imagine thinking they was doing good when they come back i said boys you guys get the hell out of here you might get fired why i said i'll tell you later then he'd come back he said you talked to him boy i said yeah he says good he says uh i might have lost my temper but all the whole time I've, I, I never heard fuller raise his voice unless he was laughing about something he was just talk like this Hey, have them go seven, do this, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Easiest people to get, a, to get along with. You know what I mean? And just, some, just really smart. Someone told me to ask you about Miss Brenda. She died in, I think, 2002. Okay. But she had, uh, let's just say, oh, she, she was a stripper for how many years? Road girl. Yeah. So she didn't smoke cigarettes, but there's always cigarette smoke in the buildings. Yeah. So she got to like the lung thing or whatever. Oh. And then she died, I think it was about 2002 or something like that. And you've brought up uh, Adrian Street. I've done an interview with him. I'm a big fan of his. What was it like working with him? Oh, unbelievable. Here's a, a little tough son of a bitch. One of the toughest son of bitches in the world. We never had one 
disagreement about anything. He says, you want to do this? Ah, let's try this. Let's do that. And we just fucking clicked right away. Uh, night one in, we shoot the fucking angle. He had, I had the girl, he had the girl. It was just fucking perfect. So easy to get along with. The first night in Global for Joe Petticino, the first main event there at the Global Dome, which is a sportatorium, was me against him. That night I was up in his room all night. He's drinking fucking wine. And he's telling me stories about his whole career when he was kid Tarzan Jonathan and about his dad and where he came from the mines and shit, getting into physique early and everything. And, and like when he come over to uh, America, he was 40 some years old. And he said when he was in, over in uh, working for uh, uh, in England and stuff, he would make this much money because everybody else was wrestling. He was a tough ass, but he did nothing but flamboyant and he was making all this fucking money, but he wanted to come to America. You know what I mean? But he, he was just fucking awesome. Awesome to work with, awesome guy. His, uh, they made all the fucking tights and shit, you know. And uh, he was just, I told him, I said, your only problem is you was 20 years ahead of your time. You know what I mean? He was just so fucking good. Hell, he would do, go to Birmingham and do, uh, he made albums, he was doing videos, I don't know how many years before that. He would do his own fucking songs and stuff. He was just an over motherfucker. He knew how to make fucking money. And this is, God, this is in Knoxville in uh, like 80, 86. Every Knoxville show, he'd make a thousand bucks selling pictures. You know what I mean? Fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he saved it all. It wasn't stupid. But now he, he, he moved back. Yeah. You know, he moved back, you know. But what a, no, we could have a, you want to work, you want to break a sweat tonight? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned Puerto Rico a couple of times. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about uh, work in that territory? Well, that's night and day. Okay, Puerto Rico. I remember I closed TV down. Uh, two Wendy's in a row going in the fan, going, going after the marks. Shit, you go to the ring, they're throwing batteries at you, they're throwing rocks at you. Uh, they would have the chicken wire, like in the Blues Brothers. A, a lot of places didn't have the ringside to protect the fucking wrestlers. And they would have all the guys, the security, like protect the guys. They'd have them stadium shows, there'd be thousands of people there on a Saturday night and stuff. And then, and uh, I had my, had my own TV show there. I I did the the, the American uh, the English speaking version, and hell, I guess posed the Mr. Puerto Rico over there, <laughs> and I I get on and call them the greasy Puerto Ricans, the beaners and shit. Them motherfuckers just hated you, and but I had to be more of an aggressive character there. Uh, but had some great times there, and it, and it was great because you learned a different style. You learn that violent style. You learn not to take too many bumps. You learn to go with the wah. It was a punch kick territory. And you hit the guy and you wah. And the heel, as soon as you went down, they stopped fucking wahing. So you destruct and almost go down and almost go down and almost go down and find the big, and boom, you go down. And they, ah, it was just so much fun. It was so, it was so fucking easy. But they lived by the blade there. And, and I told him, I said, no, nah, I ain't doing it, you know. So I'd work with Jose or whatever, and I'd get the fucking blood off his head and put it on my, my, my white hair, you know, and that was it. So I was there for nine months, so I had a hell of a time there. Still got, for, the, the Hurricane Hugo was there. Hurricane Hugo was in there. So I went off the middle of the island with some guy, the, 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 the Vietnam guy had the heavy truck. We went to try and escape from dying. So I said, well, hell, we might die tonight because the hurricane was coming. So we had the buffet laid out. I took a bunch of fucking pills, uh, uh, gave myself a wank about three fucking times, and took some pills, be ready to fucking die. Woke up the next day, hey, I didn't die, all right. And then we go downtown, and we see all the fucking uh, looting going on. And I'm looking, holy shit, look at this shit. Then we see the cops come, they run all the fucking looters off. Then the cops start fucking looting. <laughs> and then the, the, the National Guard comes in, runs all the cops off. <laughs> but it was just oh what a what a different place it was. I just I just, I liked it there. It dangerous as fuck. But I like going to South Africa when we had riots in Durban three Saturday nights in a row. Working with Tiger G Singh is fucking awesome. Did you ever have pay issues for Carlos? No, no, because he shit on the locals like every territory. Uh, when I went there. I had a guarantee. I said, you don't make my guarantee, 
That's simple. You know I'm leaving. How was Jose Gonzalez to work with? Well, this was after the Brody incident. So uh, he come in. And he, one time he says, Amigo, come in the shower. I want to talk to you. I said, oh, no, fuck you. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't mean I said, well, you didn't mean it. Uh-uh. No. But uh, I, did I ever have a problem with him? No. Did I have a problem with anybody there? No. And it's like, it was funny because, like, Jovica was the head owner. Yeah. And then he work underneath there and do jobs. He make money, right? Then when they go to what was it Trinidad? When we go to Trinidad, yeah. Then Victor was the star. Yeah. And Carlos worked underneath. He was like the king of Trinidad. You know, yeah. we go over there and you get cash going over there. It was dangerous over there. Uh, it was dangerous in Puerto Rico, but fuck, that's the way it was. It was dangerous in the Bahamas when I worked for uh, out of Tampa. But uh, different stuff. Great to learn a different style. Learn great to learn about different stuff about TV. I remember I was working with Salvio Vega, right? I said, "T, we're going an hour." He goes, "What? We're going an hour?" I said, uh, "About 59. Make your comeback. Savat kick. Uh, Cobra. I'll run out of, and we'll run out of time." He goes, "Yeah, I see you. That's the way I worked." He, I, 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 shut up. I know what you can do. Don't worry about it. If you talk to him, he'll talk about. It. He says, "This is how I learned." You know what I mean? He says, I've never seen anything like that before. I, I'm not into learning. I walk into a place, I start laughing. I go to W7, and guys are in the ring practicing a match. i never seen anything like it before. What's so funny is like, Randy carried me the first how many years of my of the career, right? Yeah. Never in my life did I see him do a, anything choreographed. And now I heard you know him and Ricky Steamboat had a choreographed match, right? I never seen a WrestleMania thing in my life. I said, no, I ain't no fucking, I don't believe that. And they said, yeah. I said, holy shit, he must have changed. I said, he obviously changed. But I was taught, call it in the ring, and that was it. It just night and day, but I would not believe he had a choreographed match. I would not. Because I never, because I had all the matches with him, and he's carrying me 40 minutes of need be when I'm horrible. Right. And everything was called in the ring. Did you stay friends with Randy till the end? Or? Well, uh, we Randy wanted me in the company, so I came in. Then he wanted me out of the company. Randy was a competitor. I think his dad would dig him when I'd beat him in bodybuilding contests. He'd get on the gas. I wouldn't. Do you see him in that Batman movie, how big he was? And when he died, he died from heart issues. His, fa his mother was 90, uh, at least 90 when she passed. Angelo was late 80s, I'm thinking, epitome of health. So, you know, Randy had always had a size issue. So he was on the gas at least 30, 30 years, you know what I mean? Which had to destroy his insides up. And you know, when you do it that long, you're gonna pay the piper. You wish you didn't earlier. Uh, but this or that, and then all of a sudden he just started not, uh, the thing was really, and you can hear it right here on Hannibal's TV, uh, I was married to Brenda, he liked her. We lived together. He went to her, she said, no, he's crazy. We moved in together and we got married, you know what I mean? So then there was tension, I never had any tension before. I was too naive, too green to see it. And are you still married? Uh, I'm on number two. Second wife, yeah. Number two. And yeah. your kids are... Uh, uh, oh, I get this got Marcus. He's 21. Okay. Going to University of Indianapolis, you know. He's six foot two, six foot three, whatever. Uh, just whatever. Is he, he going to wrestle? Oh, hell no. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> and where can we follow you on social Oh, hell. Media? Hustler2754 on Twitter. Got to do that. Hustler2754 on Twitter. Any advice for being a, a heel that you could give us? Uh, learn from old guys that have really been there. You know what I mean? Uh, learn to sell each other, learn to call it in the ring. Because you're gonna have a match, you get a chance for the big time. Uh, oh, you're going 11 minutes. You walk through the grill, they say cut it to eight. You get to near the ring, they say, oh, now it's five. You get through the ropes, they say go home. Now what do I do? I have no pre-planned bullshit. No, I know what to do. Don't worry about it. You know this fucking business. 
And any final thoughts you want to tell the fans to close this off? Uh, I can't get on you for love wrestling, whether you love lucha, whether you love dick spots, whether you love stupid dive shit that makes no sense to me. If you love wrestling, keep supporting wrestling because I love wrestling.